Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over this galaxy. <laughs> uh, this galaxy. I'm David Wood, D Doug Dizzle, and with me now is Vocab Malone, who wants to talk about aliens. Facts. Aliens. I do want to talk about aliens. I'm going to talk about aliens. Hey, hey, before we uh, before we get started, hey guys, how many of you believe that there are aliens out there? And I mean other creatures. Well, you could have different levels, right? You could have life on another planet, but it's just like you know plants or something like that. Uh, but uh, you know, actual aliens. Like, you know, Klingons somewhere out there. Or they might be like aliens in the movie Aliens. Like what do you some guys... form of, of intelligent life, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, what do you guys think? We're, we're specifically going to be talking about aliens and religion. Namely how certain religions and cults uh, talk about aliens and uh, go to the Bible and so on. Any, why don't you go ahead and introduce the topic vocab before we actually... Um, before we actually you know, start going through video clips or going into more detail. No doubt. Well, there's a whole bunch of different questions here as you've uh, already laid out. One is, does life exist in some way on other planets? Then the question is, does intelligent life exist on other planets? Because you have physical life on other planets or somewhere in the galaxy, but not necessarily intelligent life. Then there's another question of have we made contact with them in some way? Uh, have they made contact with us here on Earth or has anything like that happened anyway? Is there such thing as an, an encounter with an extraterrestrial? And when I say extraterrestrial in this context, we're not speaking uh, just yet. We're going to get into that thesis about aliens or demons because technically you could call them extraterrestrials. We're speaking about uh, in the sense of ETs, aliens extraterrestrial vitters from other planets. Uh, then there's another question about UFOs. Are any UFO are any UFOs, which of course just means an unidentified flying object, are any of them actually spacecraft or some other kind of vehicle that are ultimately uh, owned or the person's responsible for them are aliens? Because you can have a UFO, but that doesn't necessitate that it is manned or in some way, you know, they could have drones by an alien species from another life. So there's that question. Then uh, all these questions should really be evidentially based. Um, and part of the Christian's evidence must be the Bible as they take into account their worldview. And then we also ask the question, I just mentioned the Bible for the Christian. Does the Bible mention anything about aliens in any significant way or perhaps spacecraft does it mention those because people that are proponents of different versions of believing in aliens such as the ancient alien or ancient astronaut idea they a lot of times will say that the bible includes evidence that there were alien encounters in the bible and so you have all these various uh, factors going on there's a few more questions we could ask of course but those are some of the things we're going to talk about today and we're going to take notes of the rise of ufology embedded in a lot of modern religions, a lot of various cults. Some can probably be described as UFO cults proper, like the Hale Bop folks, um, or, or the Raelians, or you have um, groups or cults or religions that have alien aspects or ufology in their theology, such as the Nation of Islam or Scientologist or something like that. And so uh, I try to be fact-based, evidence-based, I'm a Christian, so part of my evidence and facts is a scripture. And then we look at that in conjunction with other things, and we ask real questions. And um, I uh, basically, the, the short version for me is there's no evidence, there's intelligent life on other planets, and I even say there's no evidence that we've had contact with, with them. Of course, that would necessitate if they're not there, we're not going to have contact with them. And I would say the, the biblical position leans against the idea of intelligent life on other planets, 
And uh, almost all these encounters and abductions and sightings can almost all be described by natural phenomena. And there's a very small amount of them that we might want to discuss that may not have immediately ready, ready uh, natural explanations. And those, those are kind of the most interesting, but they're certainly a minority within what people are claiming uh, happens. And there are some troubling aspects about the UFOs embedded in a lot of these religions that are mainly products of the 20th and now 21st century. Yeah, um, we, we have a bunch of different perspectives here. Uh, we have people who uh, believe in aliens, people who don't believe in aliens, and different reasons that people are giving uh, for what they think about aliens. And some people saying that um, aliens are demons and things like that. And so uh, we have a bunch of different perspectives. I'll, I'll just go ahead and fill people on, fill people in on my view. Um, I remember growing up, even when I was a little kid, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine, I had no problem with the idea of aliens, but all the stories of aliens visiting Earth, I thought those were pretty ridiculous because my thinking was just, you know, simple. I was thinking, wait, you t you're telling me this alien f flew here in a ship from another star and when he gets here after all that space you know after all that you know all that flying through space he decides to go probe some redneck in his cornfield like you know you would think they would show up and you know greetings earthlings something like that try to establish communication right. or something like that or or david they they fly perhaps millions of miles right david mm -hmm. And then they get to Earth in their highly technologically advanced spacecraft that just traveled from planet whatever. And the first thing they do is crash. Yeah. <laughs> the, the very first thing the alien yeah, yeah. does is crash into the Earth's surface. You know, the weather storms were just too much. You know, forget about the asteroids and conquering the physics of, of the light years of travel. They get to Earth and, oh, no, there's rain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so so Vocab and I were, I'm guessing we we're both a little bit skeptical about some of the claim possible possible but you know when we're hearing the claims you know as vocab's pointing out you flew across the galaxy to get here and then you know you crash in someone's field or something like that then you know that there's something there's something a little a little off about that or you travel all this way just like you mentioned to, to speak to some you know a redneck uh, ostensibly you travel all this way just to create a pattern in some guy's crops. Yeah. You want to cut circles in there to say, you know, send people signals or something like that. What is this alien? What is this alien horticulture? Like, yeah, yeah. and it, what, what's funny about that is, David, uh, you'll hear these guys be like, well, uh, you know, we can't, humans can't do that. And you'll find out that humans can do that. They yeah. can do that exact yeah. thing. The funniest thing I ever saw of this was in this documentary. And this guy wanted to basically disprove a lot of the alien phenomena because he had a friend who was caught up in it. And so he said, let's go on a trip across the country and let's let's see if there's any truth to what you believe. So he was trying to help his friend out. So he goes and one thing that he did that was the funniest thing in this whole little documentary, David, I feel like you would appreciate it, is uh, he ha he's at this guy's field and he shows him because he, he knows he's a true believer. He shows him the evidence of the crop circles on the ground. So nice. they have not they have not gotten to the aerial yet. Right. Mm -hmm. They're just on the ground. And, uh, you know. The audience is in on the joke, but he shows this guy, and this guy is supposed to be an expert. He's like, well, you can tell by the pattern, by the way the, the stalks of grain fell, that this is clearly uh, alien activity. Like he goes in this whole thing how this is obviously alien activity based upon what he saw on the ground. So they they get a plane. They get a small plane. <laughs> they go up <laughs> and what the guy had had carved, because the guy did it the night before, mm. <laughs> was a fist uh, like this with the middle <laughs> finger up. <Yeah. laughs> So he looks at it's flipping him off from the from the ground. You know, the it's clearly, you know, human invention. And the guy was super upset. The guy in the plane that uh, realized he had been had was so angry. It'd have been funny if he'd have done it, but with like an alien fist with like three fingers on it. Yeah, but then you wouldn't know it's a middle finger, just like E.T., you know, poking Elliot or something. But yeah. Yeah. So uh, um, we have Steffi here. She says, uh, I think UFOs are secret military. That, that's been my inclination whenever I've talked to someone I trust. Like, uh, I was locked up with a dude named Doan, and he admitted that he was stoned out of his mind. But he said uh, he passed out on a softball field and uh, woke up, and he said there was this ship over him that was, like, as big as the softball field and stuff like that. And and, uh, and he was dead serious. He's like, look, I was stoned, but, you know, I, I could still, you know, I wasn't that stoned. 
And uh, so I was like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, could it be a government ship or something like that? He goes, I have no idea. It was just a big, it was just a big giant thing hovering over me. So there's those kinds of issues. But uh, uh, anyway. Well, so, can I comment on that real quick? Oh, yeah. So who are, uh, Steffi is a lot more uh, grounded in this than I think a lot of people are because we got to stop and look at the, the, the idea of a UFO. All it means is you, whoever sees it, whoever the you is, mm -hmm. they don't know what it is. And I think we should understand that. But people do sometimes make the leap that a UFO equals a flying saucer. Well, hold on. A flying saucer is identified. So if it's a flying saucer, we know what it is, right? If it's merely something you don't know what it is, it's not immediately identifiable. It just means you don't know what it is. So it's not explained, but that does not mean it's unexplainable. And from what I've looked in, and I don't claim to be expert on this. I kind of recently got into this for a variety of reasons. A lot of the things that uh, that people do see that it seems like they really have seen and they really the, – these objects do uh, act odd – and, and, they're, and what it looks like they're doing physically, meaning it doesn't uh, follow what you would think a normal jet would do. The ones we can't explain, it does seem like the evidence leans or these are actually government's, government experiments. That's exactly what they are. And uh, not always only our government. There's other governments that can be involved with this. But the government does not have an interest to say, hey, this is actually our secret aircraft. We're working on this. We're working on that. Because the government has worked on some weird stuff. The government really did have a thing called MK Ultra, where they really did try to do mind control. It, and, and if you read about MK Ultra, it, it sounds like a conspiracy theory. Then you read about it and you realize this really happened, and it kind of got out of control. It didn't really uh, it wasn't very successful. But the government does weird stuff. They might be working on actual anti gravity uh, crap. This is this is real things, right? So a lot of this stuff is it appears is government stuff. Heiser has a good DVD on this called Aliens and Demons. And he, he, I think, gives evidence a lot of stuff is exactly that, except I don't agree with all of his uh, – I don't agree with all his positions, especially towards the end of the DVD. It gets a little odd. But I think he brings out that a lot of stuff is simply experimental governmental craft. That's all these UFOs are for the most part. Um, so your solution to the problem of UFOs is to deny aliens by appealing to a conspiracy theory. All right. All right. We got it. Conspiracy theories. Now, see, here's what's interesting, right? Here's what's interesting because I, you know, I'm skeptical of both aliens sightings and stuff like that. And I'm skeptical of, of conspiracy theories. So we have to, we have to get to the bottom of this, but I, I just, I just wanted to point out that, um, so when I was young, I, I, I didn't have a problem with the idea of aliens, uh, you know, in some other part of the universe, but you know, I didn't believe that they had actually come here. Um, so, but then by the time I was in high school, this is what was cool. Uh, once I, once I had taken biology and so on, and I realized how complex life is, I concluded that there's no way this ever happened again. Right. Cause keep in mind, I was an atheist. I was an atheist at that time. So I believed that it happened, looked around, obviously it happened, obviously life formed. Um, but I was like, Yep, we were the we were the lucky we were the lucky ones. This was the lucky planet. Uh, there's no way this is happening anywhere else on the planet. I mean, in the universe, uh, unless it's something vastly different in the sense that it's somehow much had much simpler origins. And lot, I've even seen some of the people commenting here that uh, someone said it's a mathematical certainty. And if 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 what you mean by that is well, you know, the universe is so big and there are so many places. Um, that you know it would, life would just just form again. No, once you once you understand the the odds of getting a single, just one single, one one just one medium length useful protein, um, you understand this this is not this is not happening again. What what I mean there is for the the simplest the simplest life on our planet I think is three it requires about three hundred and fifty functioning average medium length proteins to perform the processes in, in the cell. Um, it's either 350 or 450, and they've done knockout experiments thinking that you could get rid of a couple of functions and still have a functioning living cell. But mm -hmm. here's the problem. You can actually, you can actually take the number of particles in the entire universe and calculate all the way back to the big bang and calculate the fastest that these particles could possibly interact. You set the speed of light as an upper limit. 
right? So the fastest they could be interacting would be the speed of light. That would be the, that would be the upper limit. And then you've got all the particles in the universe, about 10 to the 80th power. And then you've got every second since the Big Bang. Th those, those are your entire explanatory resources if you're trying to account for, for life arising by chance. And what you find is you can multiply those out and you get the total possible number of particle interactions ever. And what you find is, given those odds, you're not even close to getting one protein by chance. You're not close mm -hmm. to getting one by chance. And you need all of them. You need all of them necessary for life in the same spot. And it it's just it's just not happening. And so um, so anyway, I concluded um, not not using that argument, but just just knowing the parts of the cell and thinking this, there's no way there's no way this happened, uh, which is cool because, you know, that eventually led into a kind of design argument. May, well, maybe if, it, if, I, if I already understand that this didn't this couldn't happen anywhere else, it's too improbable. Maybe it didn't happen here either. And maybe we're actually created. But now that I'm a Christian. I have no problem with the idea that God created something on, on other planets or created other species on, on other planets or something like that. Uh, but so you have a couple of questions. One, did he? You know, if you read the Bible, you don't get the idea. You know, it seems like we're center stage if you read the Bible. Um, and then two, are certain passages in the Bible talking about aliens? Or are they talking about something else? So a couple issues there. So anyway, long story short. I'm actually more open to the idea of aliens as a Christian than I was as, as an atheist. I thought there's no way it would happen as, as an atheist. Uh, as a Christian, you believe in a creator, obviously could happen. Um, the question is whether whether it did. And so th those are my thoughts on this. But we're actually uh, focused on this issue of aliens in religion vocab. So vocab, uh, you can you can talk more about this or or we can go into some stuff, whatever you prefer. Yeah, well, the, all good uh, points of what you just said. A resource for people that I think is helpful is a book uh, by uh, Jay Richards, and I believe they made a, uh, a movie about it as well. There, the the uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the the spot that that Stephen Meyer runs. The uh, what I just forgot what it is. But they focus on intelligent design. Uh, uh, the oh, Discovery the, Institute. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, there's a book You're called welcome. "The Privilege, The Privileged Planet," <laughs> the Privileged mm -hmm. Planet, and uh, I think it's really helpful to what you were talking about, and um, and 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 brings this into focus. And there's a lot of fascinating stuff in that, and I and I'm pretty sure they made a really good uh, uh, movie of it, like I said, or video, whatever you want to say. Yeah, yeah there, there's and, a uh, there, there's a there's a DVD of that, and, and along those yeah. lines. By the way, that that's that was actually part of my thinking when I was in high school. It's uh, you know, we say, oh, but there's all these different galaxies out there and stuff like that. Yeah, the vast majority of those galaxies would not be hospitable to life. Uh, mm -hmm. And even in galaxies that that you could have life in, you got to be in a very specific place in those galaxies. Like you go closer to the center of our galaxy, there's too much violent activity. Uh, if you go farther away, there aren't enough, you know, heavy elements and so and so. It's just you. You got to be. You got to be. So their argument is actually this particular planet is massively, massively. Uh, privileged yeah excellent exactly and you know uh part of most people's thinking if they're being consistent about this about why was, as far as secular intelligentsia goes why they they really push for the idea that there must be life elsewhere and you can see it evidence with you know the program like seti where we send out intelligent messages into space hoping we get some back which was uh you know romanticized or whatever in the movie with jody foster contact written by carl sagan actually um, who's uh, sort of like Darwin – or I'm sorry, Dawkins before Dawkins in a sense. Well, the idea is hey, if, if life evolved here, then it could have happened elsewhere. It must have happened elsewhere. you know. But just like you said, it does seem biblically that the earth is a center stage. You know, Isaiah 66, 1, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Psalm 115, 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given unto the children of men. Isaiah 40, 22, I think as well says that. Romans 8, 22 – then you go over there, uh, Paul speaks about how all of creation grows because of Adam's sin. So Adam's sin had cosmic ramifications where it affects everywhere. And so at the end, you see Revelation 21, 1, where what's going to happen is there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And that goes along with the dissolution prior to that that you see in Isaiah 34, 4. So when you look at that, you have to ask yourself, 
okay, then how would aliens fit into that? Are they are they in some way affected by Adam's fall? And if so, how does that really make sense? The federal headship idea that is present with Adam, the you know we're all in Adam, or we're all in Christ. That's why that's first, second, and uh, the first and the second Adam doesn't make sense with some species living out on Mars or a moon of Jupiter or anything like that. And imagine what the gospel to them would look like. Well, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, Adam, you know, this doesn't doesn't uh, make sense. It doesn't comport. So there are problems there. It's not that it's impossible. I do think we can say, what's the scientific method on this? And then and then look. And so if someone says, well, maybe in the future, well, then OK, but that's the future. Right. So. So, OK, it could happen. And when you get into this, most of this is just bad science and a lot of ho hoaxes. And a lot of stuff that can be explained through natural phenomena or things that are misunderstood. And so when someone says, I had a sighting, what did you see? Do you, like we like that. That's a big, you know, big thing. Or who's qualified to determine what's what, you know, a sighting, a sighting of what? You know what I mean? And so there, there's a lot there to consider. Um, so do you want to move on to some uh, odd aspects of religion, how they have these in here. And what I'm trying to do, especially if you're a Christian, is I want you to think more carefully about this because uh, alien lore is way more popular than it was, say, 150 years ago. This really all began in the late 40s with Roswell. You could maybe trace it to begin sort of the late uh, 19th century with some some fiction writers such as the, you know, the War of the Worlds and things like that. But as far as when it really begins, a lot of this begins with Roswell – and then 1951, the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still. Everything has really come out in the past the time since then. This is when this rise – and so people were like, well, that's clear evidence of some kind of alien invasion or some kind of contact because you see all these more sightings. No, no, no. We're forgetting about the media and its influence on culture. I think Christians really have to really take stock and be highly skeptical about these claims and just because and, and just really ask what's really going on here. So uh, I think we're going to see more UFO religions, not less. And I think Christians seem to be much more on guard than ever before with this because there are some dangerous components to UFOlogy for Christians, such as the messages supposedly received in alien abductions. Regardless of if an abduction happens or not, David, the messaging is uh, pretty consistent and it's usually uh, bad as far as the messaging supposedly received in these alien abductions. So there's some issues. So you want to look at some clips with some uh, UFOs in the inside people's religions? Yeah, we can check them. Let me respond to one quick comment right here. Right here right. Cause it, just because this is a common uh, silly point. Uh, Anthony says, when you look at the size of the universe, all holy books make no sense. <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> the claim is, uh, you know, you got your holy books. They don't make any sense. If you got a big giant universe, you'd expect God to make a little tiny universe, I guess. Um. <laughs> well, for the Christian, what do the heavens do? They declare the glory of God. Yeah, and, and you know, you know. Well, what, what's funny about that is uh, the entire, you know, the reason we have, you know, William Lane Craig being a champion of the Kalam cosmological argument, the reason we know that the universe had a beginning, it hasn't always existed, right? So, so for, for you know, a long time, there was a dispute about whether the universe is eternal or whether it actually has a beginning. The argument for the beginning of the universe is that the universe is expanding. And how do you know that the universe is expanding? Well, you see those galaxies far, far away, and they're massively redshifted, which means that they're moving away from each other very, very rapidly. And so you do the math and calculate backwards, and that's how you know that the universe actually has a beginning. So you don't even know that kind of stuff. So you wouldn't even be able to, if you had a little universe that's not expanding or something like that, you, you wouldn't even know that stuff. You wouldn't even be able to make an argument that the universe had a beginning, apart from just apart from just revelation or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I'm not... I want, yeah. to, I, I, want, I want to say the reverse because um, if you you can if you listen to if you listen to cosmologists the a, a a small universe something like that a small simpler universe is much more likely is much more likely to happen in you know some whatever you want to go with if you're talking about cosmic vacuums and stuff like that if you're getting universes something smaller and simpler is much more likely to form than some giant thing like this and so. I'd kind of say the reverse. It's kind of the bigger and more amazing it is. I don't know. Seems like the more you need a pretty big creator. All right, you want to go into some clips? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, uh, I, you know, I, I do urban apologetics, and so I look at various uh, uh, groups, and that's kind of how I got into this, is because I saw uh, a strange and incursion uh, of um, some ufology-type stuff in, in even some of the alternative urban uh, groups that I studied, and uh, that kind of led me to look at the larger phenomenon to an extent, because um, – Historically, uh, a lot of black folks have made fun of ufology as white people stuff, mm -hmm. but it seems like that's changing. It seems like that's changing. And you look at some of the religions that bears witness, Nation of Islam and the Hebrew Israelites, for example, and you also have uh, the really just again, it's the people do not. I think we really underestimate how powerful pop culture is in shaping people's consensus. Like it is a proven fact when you when you study this in depth. That after the day the Earth stood still and some other uh, things like covers of science fiction books came out, when people would have certain experiences, mm -hmm. they'd be describing these aliens just like they were portrayed in certain media. It's it's a it's a, it's a fact. Now did they always do it on purpose? Were they ripping them off? I don't we don't I don't know about that. Now, I don't think everyone involved is a fraud, but it's 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 interesting that they were portraying them in terms that they had seen in some way. Maybe it's subconscious. Don't know, but you, you can really see this. And another interesting thing that relates to this is you have a situation where a lot of times the aliens themselves, if you notice the technology that they're described as having when people do describe these encounters, it matches a lot of times foreseeable technology or technology we have. For example, aliens using needles. Well, it, it's way better to get uh, – It's way you can learn a lot more by doing various scans of the body than you can with needles. And yet they've got aliens poking people with needles all the time instead of scanning them because when a lot of the stuff was invented, you didn't have that technology. So people got aliens with needles, right? Yeah, yeah I'd, use, biopsies I'd use a tricorder. I'd, I'd use a tricorder, man. Oh, hang on. Exactly. Hang on. Someone said my mic is too low. Is that is that the case? Check, 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 check. Let me turn, let me go ahead and turn it up. Just a little Sorry me to tell check, 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 check. Oh, hang on. Let, let me respond to this little comment because this is this is back what I was talking about before. Uh, Brenda said that's a non sequitur. I assume she was talking about assume she was talking about me talking about the universe. Uh, no, no I, I, I think people are trained just to say non sequitur whenever they don't agree with something. Um, mm -hmm. No, Brenda, that would not be a non sequitur. That's an argument. The, the idea here is very similar. Um, if you're walking around and you see, you find an arrowhead on the ground, well, you can make an argument that, uh, you can make an argument that, you know, maybe that arrowhead formed by some sort of natural process. If you find a computer, that becomes way, 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 way more improbable that something like that formed by chance. Well, you can you can actually you can actually do this with with the universe and the properties it has and things like that and and the things in it. You know, the the more you're trying to explain by chance, the more improbable your explanation becomes. So yeah, if you were just trying to explain away an arrowhead or something like that, well, yeah, you could imagine given enough time. Well, let, let me give you another example. You know, you, you could you could look up in a cloud and sometimes a cloud will look like a, a turtle or something like that. If you were walking through a cave, which actually happened at some point, and you found the the Venus de Milo broken in two pieces. Right. That, that's that they found the, the Venus de Milo in an underground cavern. Right. How did they know that that thing is not a natural rock formation? Well, you could, you could say, hey, that thing, you know, th those two broken pieces, that, that, that's a natural rock formation. You could say that. But the, the more you have to explain by natural causes, the, the less probable your, your explanation is going to become. So when you have the entire universe and life and um, the constants of physics and so on, it becomes really, really improbable to just say, yep, happened, boom, boom, exploded out of nowhere. So not yeah. enough, you, can, you, can, you can disagree with the argument. That's not the same as there being a non sequitur. Right. No, good point. And you know... Uh... <sighs> I'm not saying that anyone believes in aliens has these philosophical underpinnings, mm -hmm. but we need to at least recognize. Uh, I just mentioned how evolution is the backdrop of some of people's idea. Well, there must be, right? This kind of idea. Well, there must be because it happened here. Why not over there and over there, right? There's a there's another issue, and you see this briefly come up in a, a pretty well known uh, Richard uh, Richard Dawkins interview, and uh, I believe the original source was with uh, your guy who was originally you know, Bueller. Ben Stein in his uh, huh. Expelled documentary where he interviewed him, and Dawkins said he was trying to be charitable, and he basically said, well, if you wanted some version of intelligent design, I could see it if it was seeded here by aliens who came and, and sort of dropped it off. 
that'd be the way I could have, I guess you could have intelligent design. And so it is important to recognize some, some people like astrobiologists, for example, some who are saying, let's look to the stars, let's look to the clouds, let's look for evidence uh, that aliens came here, this and that. Sometimes it's because uh, they believed in pan or transpermia, uh, the idea of life seeded, created by intelligent beings from somewhere else. So they're willing to have, in essence, what is intelligent design. They're in a sense granting, okay, there's an intelligent design, and it is produced also by a higher power, a higher being, uh, but not not deity, of course, aliens who are much more advanced than us, seeded life here, and that explains life. Now, of course, we all recognize where we should. That is simply not dealing with the question of where did the aliens come from, right? Or did, how did they get here in the first place? It doesn't really answer the question of, of life on Earth in a very satisfactory way because it's not dealing with the universal implications. But it is a fact that some of the philosophical presuppositions for some of this drive are very secular indeed. Now, again, I'm not saying you can't be a Christian and da-da-da. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we should recognize some of the presuppositions driving some of this uh, search because there are some people who are looking for even the, the the clouds, the stars, for a savior. Now, they'll come and show us how to be peaceful. They'll give us this new technology. We are you know, peace. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Mars attacks. <laughs> oh, I was, I was going to – that was V. <laughs> Yeah, well, because in Mars Attacks that uh, my friend Abu turned me on to, you know, the, the aliens are, are going around zapping everybody with their lasers, right? And they just disintegrate, <laughs> turn into nothing. And while they're doing it, we are your friends. We are peaceful. We <laughs> we are your friends. Well, we mean peace. I know. <laughs> the whole time they're zapping them. I don't know where they come from, but I know which religion they follow. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm yeah. not gonna name it, but those those Mars attack aliens. You know what religion they serve? Yeah. Well, their their language goes ak 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 bar. Just kidding. Mm, greetings. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So okay. So let's look at a clip here. Uh, go, going back to this, uh, Louis Farrakhan is the leader of the Nation of Islam. And uh, he inherited it from Fard, who he's going to call Fard. <laughs> you, when, you, when you guys see the clip, you'll know what I'm talking about. And then after him, Elijah Muhammad, who also mentored Malcolm X. Now, Farrakhan's still alive. Or should I say Farrakhan? Uh, Farrakhan! <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting carried away. He's still alive. But a lot of people don't know that Nation of Islam as further evidence that they are not truly Islamic, has key aspects of ufology in their religion, such as a mothership, which they do identify with the wheel, saw, and Ezekiel 1. That's how they're describing it. And I have a one-minute clip, if David can play it, that gives evidence of this. And he basically says, Elijah Muhammad is driving a spaceship. Mm -hmm. So are you uh, ready, to play, this? <laughs> ready uh, to play this? Oh, one second before I have to get rid of this. Uh... Adamas dad said uh, to serve mankind. You know what he's talking about there? The Twilight Zone? Oh, no, did you, did you ever catch that one? Yeah. No. It's kind of a spoiler alert, but I mean, gosh, if you haven't seen this old episode of the, the Twilight Zone by now, but there were these aliens there. Who, same idea. They're, they're just here uh, to help. And their book is called To Serve Mankind. And they're talking about all the ways they're going to help and they're going to bring human beings to their planet and stuff like that. So they keep loading, yeah. loading human beings onto the, their spaceship. And then they find out, and the guy yells at the end, "It's a cookbook! <laughs> it's, it's a cookbook! To, oh, jeez! Get it to serve mankind. It's about oh, it's about yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a it's a oh, it's a cookbook gross. about different ways to cook human beings and so on." Wow! <laughs> right. All right. You want to go into this Farrakhan clip? Yes. And and guys, just just. Farrakhan. I'm not saying that everyone who believes in aliens believes the same way. And this actually, even though it is a little funny, is not intended to, to just poke fun at the NOI, okay? Uh, don't go there. But the thing is, uh, this shows the incursion into places you may not know about and how quickly bizarre it can get. And once you start relying upon special revelation outside the Bible, supposedly, really the gates are open to anything, as evidenced by this clip. You see that wheel? That's from a giant mechanical object, which is the mind of Master Fard Muhammad, <laughs> the master of the wheels. He helped to make me. 
You can take it or let it alone. He made my father, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. You thought you killed Elijah. Come on. I don't represent no dead Elijah right, Muhammad. Sir. I represent a living right. Elijah Muhammad right. who is on the wheel. And I had the two pictures floating around on the, on the, on the airplane That's right. to let you see who's the master of this day that we're in. Yes, sir. Well, that was pretty powerful. July 4th, 2020. Well, that's 2020. Yep, July fourth, 2020. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's kind of, he's kind of. Seems like he's kind of slowing down because I mean, gosh, Farrakhan, you got to give credit where credit is due. That dude is one of the best speakers of all time. You got. Oh yeah, yeah. Phenomenal. His power, his oratory, uh, his power is very powerful, no doubt. I mean, he is older. He's been through a lot. He's conquered uh, some some sickness and all that. And um, you know, it's a big question: what is going to happen to him? Uh, what's going to happen to the NOI, rather, when he dies? There doesn't seem to be a good successor. But never underestimate the NOI. Uh, if you poke around long enough, you'll find that they have a number of younger men who have become very adept at using social media. And uh, the big guy, uh, I did a show with BK Apologist. Shout out to him. Everyone subscribe to his channel if he pops up. Riza Islam, I believe is how you say his name. He, he's got a grip of social media influence. And you even get Hebrews lights and other people sharing his videos. And so uh, he's not the only one. There's another guy named Brother Ben X. And so uh, these guys end up getting to be on the Breakfast Club and talking to Charlemagne and stuff like that. And so they they uh, they never underestimate or count the NOI out. But it is interesting to see what will happen when Farrakhan passes. But did you hear what he said? Yeah, he said, uh, fired! <laughs> <laughs> and then he said he is alive manning this this spaceship. You know, that, that's what he – that's what he's saying. Like Elijah Muhammad is flying a spaceship right now, and apparently Farrakhan saying he got a picture of it. He did. I saw, we all saw it. Some people yeah. doubt and saying it looks like the sun peeking through something. Come on. You guys saw the definitive proof that Master Fired Muhammad was – peeping at you from a spaceship. <laughs> and what's important, what's important about that is this shows how if you do have what technically is a UFO, mm -hmm. you can literally exegete it any way you want. So you can say, well, that's a mothership with Elijah Muhammad at the wheel, right? Or you can say, that's a peaceful alien coming to share his technology with us. Or those are aggressive aliens scouting out because they're going to destroy us like an Independence Day or try. You, you see, you can l say it's whatever. And that's where Christians, I think, sometimes got to be careful because what a lot of Christians say who get into this is it's all demonic activity. Now, here's the thing. I don't, I, I don't discount that possibility for some of these things, some of these encounters people are saying that they have happened. Uh, and I, I talked to Heiser about this. He said, look, when it comes to the craft, they are unidentified or most likely, most of the time, uh, natural phenomena or these are experimental. Uh, <laughs> take the wheel. These are experimental spacecraft. He said when it comes to the abductions, the ones that that may be real, there may be demonic activity there. And there's some evidence – now, I've got to look more into it by a guy named Guy Malone that studies this – that that people that um, basically bring Jesus into the picture. So they become Christians, uh, and then they they in, in, invoke uh, their, the covering of Jesus in their life in some way, you know, in Jesus' name, that these, these alien abduction experiences cease. Now, I have to still look more into that because I some of the Christians that have gotten involved with this I find are kind of wacky. And I'm not saying Guy Malone. I'm just saying some of them are. So I'm still looking into that. That is possible that the alien abductions in some instances could be demonic activity. That is possible. But here's the problem. I find too many Christians automatically saying, well, look, they reported it. Therefore, it happened. Just because they report an abduction does not mean it really happened. I think we need to be very careful about that. Very, very careful about that. Such as Ray Ale, who is a leader of the Ray Alien cult, who is a French – like race car driver or something, and now started this group called the Ray Aliens who wear all white with a 
Star of David with a swastika in the middle as their as their medallion. He says he had an encounter with a being named Yahweh. Right? So he, you could say, well, that's clearly he he encountered a demon, or he's just making it up. Mm-hmm. We, we I don't I don't know for sure, right? I mean, I don't I think it's dangerous for Christians to de- definitively say that's what it is. Do not forget how many liars and charlatans and con men there are in this world. Never forget that. And so they might just be talking crap because guess what? Ufology and the in the conference circuit and jumping on these these History Channel shows now is actually a decent way to make a little cash and do all right for yourself these days. It can be lucrative. You know what I'm saying, and so I think uh, people need to recognize that. But but look at that. I mean, you know, he's saying that these UFO craft are going to come and uh, destroy America. That's what he's saying. And Elijah Muhammad apparently is manning one of them. Probably, probably the best one. Yeah, the, um, he's got the tricked out one. He's, he got, he's the, got like he got the spinning rims and stuff. Yeah, he's got like he's got like the one with the gold. Which the actually, gold which wheel. actually sounds like the prophecy, man. You know, he got some spinning rims on that thing. Well, um, okay, you want to go to Ezekiel one then? Uh, yeah, yeah, we we can. Uh, can we play that Heiser clip before we look at Ezekiel one? I it's only three minutes, and I think he does a good job. Now, again, I do not co-sign everything Heiser says, although I wouldn't want to argue with him. The dude is one of the most knowledgeable. And uh, guys out there, right? So don't get, uh, I don't want to argue with Heiser, but I just don't buy all his conclusions. But he's good on helping people see Ezekiel 1 is not about a UFO. Because have you ever seen Chariots of the Gods, David? Came out in 1970, one of the first films on this that, that promoted this uh, ancient astronaut idea. It kind of set it all off. A guy named Von Daniken nope. uh, as a Swiss guy. And it set it all off. You can watch it on um, on on, on uh, you can watch it on YouTube, right, or Amazon Prime. It's pr- it's pretty creepy. But a, a lot of stuff that's come since him is sort of a ripoff of a guy named Stitchin uh, and Van Doniken. And and, uh, and I recommend uh, Crash Go the Chariot. It's a little book written way back then by a biblical scholar who showed that Chariots of the Gods, uh, the book and the movie, uh, a bunch of crap. Like Van Von Daniken, I'm gonna keep on messing up his name. Uh, uh, claim to breed languages. There seems to be no evidence to that. He seems to be one of the first guys who promoted this. Ezekiel 1 is actually evidence that the prophet Ezekiel encountered some kind of alien craft. So it seems like you're smiling. You want to say something? You're smiling about something. No, I just think of stupid stuff. I just think of stupid oh, stuff. And I was thinking <laughs> I was thinking if I was that Swiss dude, I'd be like, uh, if you don't believe in aliens, how do you explain our awesome army knives huh <laughs> anyway that's, that's i was just thinking of that right i was thinking how would a how would a swiss guy make an argument like what what do they have that they could really argue has to come from because you know how furniture pe- yeah furniture you know, maybe you know how people are like oh you know you need aliens to build the pyramids or something like that so i was thinking what, what do they have what do they have in switzerland like coco you know <laughs> anyway i thought i thought of what? uh I thought of I thought of Swiss Army knives, and then I thought how stupid that was. So I kind of laughed at myself, and I wasn't going to say it. But then you know, you 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 brought, you called me out on it. Actually, what's funny though, in all seriousness, David, what you just said, I am not kidding you because I've been looking into this. There are people out there who promote these these the idea of ancient astronauts who came and brought us super technology mm-hmm. in some in some prior era. There are some of them who literally, it almost seems like every single uh, thing you could imagine that. That is a product of human culture. They say aliens brought it to us. This, now, granted, they this don't phone, all do that. This phone was reverse engineered from the spaceship at Area Fifty One. I, I, I'm telling you, there. No, I've I heard that know before. I've heard, I've heard that before. Yes, I, I didn't understand. One of my barbers, I didn't understand what he was saying when I first met him, and he started. He, he was. He kind of spoke cryptic, 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 cryptically. But I realize now as I look more at this, my barber was just – all he was doing is advancing because he was saying stuff like all the Marvel movies are actually based upon um, stuff that actually happened in the past. He's like, where do you think they get that idea from? And he literally thinks all of like the Marvel material is based upon some reality in the past that we somehow have a, a nascent, inherent, latent memory of. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's dead serious. And the thing is it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of not because there is that guy, that one Greek guy. I'm not saying it was aliens. But it was aliens. Hmm. I mean, that, that seems to be like a real thing with everything. Even Transformers, one of the Transformers movies had that idea. Uh, they had uh, Megatron being ice cooled and, and under under some dam in Nevada or something like that. I forgot what the details of the first movie are. But uh, they say oh, all the major modern technology marvels of the 20th century have yeah, come by reverse engineering. Out of, yeah, out of him. Or if you watch Stargate, Stargate is these aliens who came from another planet the movie through or the, Stargate. The movie or the TV show? 
the, the movie. I never watched the TV show. I never show, saw the TV Star- show either, but I saw the movie. Stargate's Kurt thesis. Russell. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a decent movie. It's sort of silly, but it's kind of cool in a way, too. Stargate, they come, and they're responsible for the wonders and, and marvels of ancient Egypt. And uh, the, the aliens actually look like the gods of ancient Egypt. So, like, that's what that's what they're doing there. Cowboys and Aliens, that movie with the 007, the Bond guy, or Daniel, whatever his name is, that movie has part of Stitchin's theory in it that aliens uh, came here to, like, mine gold and stuff. And if you look at Cowboys and Aliens, when they discover the aliens in the movie, they're mining. My point is, this is showing up from these old, weird theories from the 60s and 70s. And people have these strange ideas. And uh, we just got to watch out for it. So, so... Let's let's look at Ezekiel one though, because there are people who say, "Well, the Heiser? aliens, yeah, the Heiser clip that is number." Right. I got it. I got it. it. It's number four. Yeah, I know. Should be number four. Um, I, I just did, three minutes. I did want to say though, I never watched uh, Cowboys versus Aliens, but uh, I like the idea of just taking those two genres together. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have this idea about. I'm just wondering if someone has done it, like in China, but like Kung Fu versus zombies. It's a zombie attack, but like, you know, centuries ago in China and like Kung Fu (laughs) masters have to fight the zombies or something like that. You put those together. No one's no one steal my idea. Don't run out and write a script until I come out with it. But, oh, we can make our own. We can just make it out in the desert. We could. We could. We come out, come out to Arizona in the winter. We we can film. We need some Asian. We need some Asian. uh, We need some Asian actors. So uh, we got Nate. Who else we got? Nate. Nate's down. Um, I can play a zombie. Uh, we, we, uh, I, I got some other homies. I got a couple homies around here. All right. Kung Fu versus zombies coming to you <laughs> later this <Yeah>, we, year <laughs> <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Michael Heiser. On Ezekiel 1. On Ezekiel 1. Mm-hmm. Hey, maybe you should get Ezekiel 1. Re- Is he going to read it? He, he he goes through some of it. I'll bring up the. Okay. I'll bring up. Uh, I'll bring it up. I'll, I'll grab my Bible right now. All right. Well, when it comes to the Book of Ezekiel, I get the question about its vocabulary a lot because most people assume that you go to Ezekiel one, you have an ancient spaceship there, uh, and it's prime five for ancient alien material. The problem is, is a lot of people don't even read it closely. Uh, for instance, if you actually look at Ezekiel account, Ezekiel chapter 1, and a lot of it's repeated in chapter 10. For instance, the only thing that's round in the chapter are the wheels supporting the rakhiach, the platform or the expanse, atop of which Yahweh, the God of Israel, is seated. There's nothing else round. And what the reason that's significant is because you look at some of these ancient alien descriptions about Ezekiel chapter 1, and they have the expanse on which Yahweh is sitting as a UFO, as though he's piloting some sort of alien craft. But if you actually read the text, the platform, the expanse, is not round. It's never described that way. The other thing about the vocabulary is Hebrew has a lot of words for round objects, other than the word for wheel. I've already said that the word wheel is in there, the four wheels and all that sort of thing. But it has a lot of vocabulary for things that are around. Kikar, uh, Shelet, Yagil. Uh, there are five or six or seven different Hebrew words that are scattered throughout the Hebrew Bible for round things. Shields, loaves of bread, that sort of thing. None of them are found in Ezekiel 1. Not a single one. So the only thing that's round when you get to Ezekiel 1 are the wheels supporting the platform. But Yahweh is not riding around in a spaceship. Uh, the, the wheels, we know what that is. We know what each, each of them are. We know why that description is what it is. Because we have iconography from the Babylonian period. Remember, Ezekiel is writing as a captive in Babylon. We have iconography from Babylonian period, earlier Assyrian periods, Phoenician material. It's a cherubim throne. It's, it's, it's a throne. It's a seat. It's a chair, as it were, mounted atop cherubim. And in some cases, those cherubim had wheels because the gods were pictured and the God of Israel is often pictured in the Hebrew Bible as riding around the sky, you know, traversing the heavens on the clouds. And so the mode of transportation other than boats in the ancient world were chariots and chariot thrones. So these are all very normal descriptions, but 
other than the wheels themselves, the expanse that people think is a UFO is never described as being round. It's a chariot. It's a thrown chariot. And it's very easy to spot and know what Ezekiel's talking about if you're familiar with the ancient Near Eastern material. Boom. Uh, I have to disagree because I clearly remember hearing a song go, Wheel in the sky keeps on turning. One second, we might have a problem here. Kung Fu. There's there's also an old um there's also an old spiritual that goes Ezekiel ah, Soul. Dang it. What what's wrong? There's a nineteen eighty one movie called Kung Fu Zombie. Hang on. Well, we have to see it. Stars see Billy Ah oh, it stars Billy Chung as a martial artist. Who must fight supernatural foes? This must not have been very good because I would have totally seen that like a million years ago. Yeah, I, I mean, grew up on those. I grew up on a kung fu theater on USA. Somebody I lost track of the comment was saying, "Oh, you guys are late to the party," and then named three people: uh, Missler, what's his name, Marzuli, and another guy. I'm, I'm trying to find it, uh, and said you need to check out their work. So here's where I'm gonna. I'm just gonna be somewhat uh, conceited or something like that. Uh, I respect and love those guys as Christians. It seems like they all are and all that. But uh, I don't think you can trust everything that they do on this topic. I've I've mentioned that I do not agree with some of uh, Heiser's view sort of of the heavens and all that. Uh, No doubt about that. However, when you get into these other guys, it really seems like their discernment on the issue is lacking. I really think they accept a lot of stuff they should not accept, and they believe some really weird stuff. And once you get deep into this rabbit hole, you can get really strange really fast. I sent my friend Alfredo Valentin, who lives in Brooklyn. I think you met him when we were out there in New York. I don't remember if you got to meet uh, my man BK Apologist. But I sent him a website the other day, David, and it literally uh, is all about Nephilim hybrids and literally says – are you a Nephilim hybrid? Has someone told you that you're a Nephilim hybrid or do you feel like you're a Nephilim hybrid? Well, that doesn't mean you're outside of the grace of God. Nephilim hybrids can be saved too. Here's the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, according to f- accord- for Nephilim hybrids. And it then broke down the gospel for Nephilim hybrids. Now, I appreciate the person's um, can-do spirit. You know, They think there's Nephilim hybrids still on the earth and they think they need the gospel, so they're going to bring the gospel to them. But that's how bizarre this gets. You know, Nephilim hybrids need Jesus too. Oh, there it is, Elizabeth Marshall Smith. You guys are really late to this dance. So first of all, you know, eh, I show up late. It's fashionable. I'm a slow cap. So what? Zola Levitt, Chuck Mister, Ellie Marzulli. Be very careful. If you're gonna look at someone, Heiser is better on this. The old book by Wilson, Crash Go the Chariots, is better than this. And even though I don't agree with all his stuff. This is a book I think you really have to have to look at this. Gary Bates, Alien Intrusion, and they also made a movie that you definitely want to go to creation.com and download it. It's one of the best movies I've seen on the topic, really well done from a Christian perspective. Start there and look at that stuff. Even Hugh Ross's uh, Little Green Men and Lights in the Sky book. Those are better than some of the really wacky speculative stuff that we really got to watch out for as Christians because – um, we start sounding crazy, and we don't realize a lot of the presuppositions from some of the people we're agreeing with are really decidedly anti-biblical. Just got to say that. Now, can we comment on Ezekiel 1 there, David? Yeah, you can comment all you want. I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature. This is uh, portions of Ezekiel 1, 15 through 20. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparked like crystal light, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not turn about as the creatures went. The rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. So you have wheels within a wheel with eyes. This is not actually for real transportation. This is symbolism describing something about the chariot that Yahweh is on. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Now, what they do is basically try to say, hey, this is like Ezekiel's overwhelmed with experience, so he's trying to write in what he knows how to write. And so that's what's going on here. He's identifying what it is he's seeing. And if you read all of Ezekiel 1, it's clear. And if you read Ezekiel 10, it's even more clear. And when you read the symbolism from the other portions of the New Testament that can can, contain similar descriptions, 
you're even closer to understanding what he said. Then when you branch outside that and look inside of some of the ancient Near Eastern context, then you start to really understand even further. So let me say this, and this was uh, some information brought up of a man, BK Apologist. I mentioned him several times. He helped me a lot on this topic. All the elements in Ezekiel's vision, everybody, are to be found in other ancient Near Eastern art and religious iconography of the day. Now, the exact thing Ezekiel describes is not anywhere in the A&E. That's, that's shorthand for ancient Near East. But each element is. So this is an amalgamation of various representative uh, aspects that he's putting together to describe the glory of God. So when you look at Ezekiel's era before and after and contemporaneous with him, you find these same elements. For example, the cloud and storm elements, incredibly common to the Old Testament. You find Yahweh is the one who rides the clouds. Our friend, I believe, um, Islam Critiqued did one on uh, Yahweh in relationship to riding, I think, not the clouds, if I'm not mistaken, but I think the storm or the, or the water or the ocean and showed how it's evidence of Jesus' deity when he walks on water in the New Testament. He has an excellent video on this. I forget the exact thing, but it's an excellent example of how to do biblical theology proper. Islam Critiqued is really sharp. That's a very good video. I think it's called Yahweh the Storm Rider or Cloud Rider or Water Walker, something like that, but it's dope. Uh, so these are these are common and you see them with the storm gods uh, from Ugarit and outside of Babylon, uh, such as Baal. He, that's who he's supposed to be. Now, that's also common in Israelite thinking. But what they do is the Israelite authors, they subvert it. They take this common religious imagery from the pagans and then the prophets subvert it and say, and God's in charge of that. That's This is a common thing that they do. It's actually polemical. And ancient Near Eastern scholars who have looked into this, I think with an open mind, but understood Israel is not uh, plagiarizing. They're simply using the language and imagery of their day, sort of the Polaroids of the ancient world is how one scholar described it. They're using those to subvert the power of these gods and say, no, no, but it's all about Yahweh. He's outsing the pagan, pagan gods, specifically here uh, along the lines of, of a Babylonian. And th this is just... A fact, and you can find it if you pick up a good commentary on Ezekiel, you'll find them talking about this exact thing. Um, and so that's very important to recognize. Now, are you able to bring up the PDF or the PowerPoint I sent you? There's five images I want to show. If you can't, don't worry about you it. You have to Actually, tell me. Actually, wait. You have to wait, tell can me I which do one it? to get. You should can be I? able to share it through okay, try, Skype try. with a screen share. Okay, I'm just going to try. If it doesn't work, we won't even worry about it, okay? You have to tell me when uh, you do it because I have to check for another camera angle. But go ahead, go ahead and try it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are experimenting. Other people have done this before, but uh, Vokib's trying to do a screen share. Let's see how this down, works out. Take down all the stuff I don't need, so I've only got the, the one guy on the screen here. Let's see if this works. And then I hit... Uh, share, share screen or something like that. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm I think I'm going to the right place here. Okay. Settings more share screen. Boom. Okay, I just hit share screen, but I haven't hit start sharing yet. I'm going to the the P, the PowerPoint itself and I just hit start sharing. Okay, I just and and, uh, and one second and all right, we have it up on the screen. Okay. So, these are uh, examples from non-Israelite art, contemporaneous before and after, uh, of Ezekiel's day. And so you see the first one, this four-faced deity, he's kind of on uh, the platform there. And then you look over and you see figure two, you see them holding up something. See the, this winged bullman as sky bears. That's, there, that's why you have these creatures who are holding the platform there. There's the, the throne. Uh, that the, and you have remember you have the throne situation the pl the throne is seat on the platform there and these are from Israel's neighbors who are not uh, believers in Yahweh and yet you have the same imagery uh, there's the wheeled platform and you also have similar stuff going on here and and again this is from their cultural neighbors and you can find this this stuff online and look at it and you'll realize a lot of the imagery is is very similar but it's used in an, an amalgamation there and here's probably um, uh, this is Alfredo's favorite one, uh, the guy who's got eyes all over him along with his junk hanging out. I'm just kidding. When we did the show, I was, te I was teasing Alfredo about sending me this picture like, bro, why are you sending me uh, obscene images? But there's the many-eyed God. Now, in the case of Yahweh, the many eyes all over the wheels, if we just stop and think about it, even if we didn't understand the A&E imagery, the wheels can go in any direction. 
This is the omnipresence of Yahweh. The eyes represent he can see everything everywhere. He's aware of it all. So he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Okay, and so that is very important. Now, here's why, and this is drawn out of a commentary. And again, shout out to BK Apologist for putting this together, a.k.a. Alfredo Valentin. With Ezekiel, this was incredibly important because he was in exile in Babylon at the time of this vision in Ezekiel 1. You know because he's beside a river that is, 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 is right outside of the city. Okay, he's in exile. He's not in Jerusalem. He's not in Israel. He was supposed to be doing priestly work. He's 30 years old, according to the vision, I believe, but he can't do priestly work because he's not in the temple. So it's almost like he's out of a job. He's in exile along with everybody else, especially the elite of Israel. So he has this vision that tells him God is with the Israelites still. And this is what the Babylonians would do. It was very common. They would take populations of people, put them in another place, and break them down that way. And so the idea, the temptation would be to leave the religion of Yahweh, to leave uh, ancient Judaism, depending on how you want to call it, what you want to frame it, and to embrace the gods of your captors because clearly their gods are more stronger according to certain understandings. There's a verse in 1 Samuel 20, 16 that explains it where you a lot of times have these tribal deities, this is the way people looked at them, who had – power based upon certain geographical locations that they were on. And that's what the screen is saying right now. And these gods could only be properly worshipped in their country. And you see an example of this with Naaman. After he is healed, he asks Elisha if he could take a patch of dirt with him uh, and worship the true God while his master, because Naaman was healed by the prophet, so he recognizes Yahweh as God now, while his master worshiped the false God, he says, can I take some dirt from Israel to worship your God? And Elisha said yes. So he sort of uh, condescended to to Naaman's understanding, which is kind of a misunderstanding, but this is how Naaman was going to worship God. He's taking what he views as holy ground, basically, to represent he's going to worship Yahweh. That's literally what he does there. And so I'm, I'm just going to show a couple other slides, simply have the slide up, because this is important to understand, because you got Christians getting all kinds of weird and wacky stuff. Oh, we got to show that in a second. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second, but uh, there's some other stuff if we have time. So you want me to go back to us? Share. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to stop sharing right now anyway. Uh, so, so the point by me bringing all that other stuff out is to say, say uh, with Ezekiel 1, it's actually very important and practical to understand what really is happening there, which is God is saying, I'm not stuck in Jerusalem. I'm not stuck inside the temple. Your your work is not done as an intercessor before the people. You, you are going to take on this prophetic ministry. I am here with the people, even though I've judged them. That's why this deportation happened. The eyes and the wheels represent that. It's nothing about a UFO. And in and, and, and the Chariots of God movie and book, they try to uh, say, look at these landing platforms. And then they put it up, kind of superimpose it with a picture of the, of the lunar module and say, that's, that's similar to what he saw. But it's ridiculous because a lunar module is not even capable of uh, planet to planet travel. That's not what it's for. So it's silly that they're drawing the comparison anyway. They say, look at the fire. That's evidence of a combustion engine. A combustion engine is not going to get you through space. There's just all this uh, bizarre like misstep that people make and we need, really need to watch out for. And all it takes is a little bit of digging around the context. You realize Nah. Now, we don't have time, so we're not going to do it today, David. Maybe if you ever want to talk about this again. There's a bunch of other places these alien uh, lookers go in the Bible to try to ransack it for evidence of encounters. But we're not going to do that now, but, but at another time we could, and we could debunk them all because none of them are what they say they are. So everybody just watch out. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I have a disturbing comment here from Jeffrey D. Mm -hmm. who says, Watch Kingdom, Chinese zombie series on Netflix – with some martial arts and versus early 2000 matrix zombie hybrid movie those are the only ones that kind of fit what you said you have any idea how messed up it is when i come up with my own idea and then it turns out other people stole it before i came up with it all right so so people have come up with some zombie some zombie kung fu movies um uh, it's now you could always make one better and mine would obviously be better but has everyone does has everyone done all the combination like have people has someone done has someone done zombies versus cowboys you know what i mean like the president is trapped in a cave surrounded by zombies and the only plan to save him is to send in a team of billy the kid jesse james wild bill hickok and doc holiday and Snake Bliskin. 
I don't know who that last How? guy is. You don't know who Snake Bliskin is? Man, get oh, out of here. The, the other escape, ones I recognize. Escape from New York and escape from Los Angeles. You got to. Oh. oh, yeah, Kurt Russell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the iPad. What does have, just have Wyatt Earp then, but okay, I got you. <laughs> yeah, the toss. Yeah, you got to toss Snake Bliskin in there. All right. <laughs> what do you want to? What do you want to do? You want to take some questions? You want to uh, uh, go through more videos? We have a. Uh... Take me to your leader. Well, so here's what we could do. Uh, we take, got here's take me to your drugs. It must be some good stuff. We could. We could. That's what we used to say. To, that's what we used to say uh, to Doan when he was talking about seeing the aliens while he's stoned out of his mind. Well, yeah, I mean, we could hear some wood stories about alien stuff because you have some funny comments. We could we could rock that or we could look at some imagery uh, from the Hebrew Israelite side of things. Oh, yeah. With what they do with UFOs, which is super bizarre. Or we could even look at the Hebrews who claims to be able to summon UFOs or we could interact with a live chat. I'm OK with whatever. It's your show. Hey, 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 hold up. You remember, uh, guys, I don't know if you watched the uh, video, but uh, way back when we were up in New York last year and we yeah. uh we went and had we rolled we rolled up on some we rolled up on a group of of uh, of uh, Hebrew Israelites in mm -hmm. Harlem, so mm -hmm. we rolled up on them while they're they're uh, they're broadcasting, and then we had like what was that? Was it like two hours? Like two hour was discussion? Two I was just standing high, there. I was just standing there because you guys know way more about it. But I was just two and a half hours. There. Yeah, but, David Wood was the cameraman. <laughs> yeah, I'm just standing there. It was cool because they all knew me. Right? <laughs> and, David Wood, you might be an Israelite because you're beatbox. <laughs> Yeah, the the lead that guy's the leader of GMS. That is the leader. He has been in this thing since the eighties. The leader of the leader of uh, GMS. What are they called? They're not called sects. What are they? What are they called? The, the camps. Different, different camps. camps. The leader of the GMS camp of the of the Hebrew Israelites <laughs> thinks I might be because uh, Voca. They they actually believe that you can be white skin, but you actually you trace your genealogy back. Uh, you are you are a Hebrew Israelite, and the way you can figure out your true genealogy is by things like how you how you can dance or, or beatbox mm -hmm. or something like that, or sing or, or something play like basketball that. or rap. Like, do you have flavor? Yeah, you so, know what I mean. Uh, they think these particular guys think Bruce Lee was a Hebrew Israelite, for example, because the way you know he had skills on that. So yeah. so people uh, they're not um, they say it's not about color. They say it's about lineage, and they mm -hmm. say. They, they believe in something called the confusion of face doctrine. Mm -hmm. And so GMS, Hebrew Israelites, believes you could look like whatever. Mm -hmm. And still that. So they all thought David was a Hebrew Israelite. And I told David, I said, I bet you these guys are going to love you. And he's like, no, they're not going to like. And right away they liked him. They know it's all, funny because it's funny because I told you I like them, too. I thought they're cool. <laughs> um, oh, so anyway, anyway, long story. You could you could still check that out on uh, on Vocab's channel where we, we you know, had that discussion. Sam Shimon was there. Uh, Adam Coleman, John McCray. Um, yeah, we all rolled up on him and, uh, what, what was funny was we left, we left and that's when, that's when they, uh, that's when they had their, their alien encounter right after we left. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was interesting is there was a fellow apologist from, uh, I believe he was, a, he was in Newark. And so he was taking the train in to try to meet up with us there at Morningside Park his name is G-Man, but he did not get there in time. We had to leave. It was it was getting pretty dark. And so we had to get back. So we're going back. But right as we were leaving, apparently G-Man came like right after us. So he had his 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 phone on and stuff. And he said when he was walking with them uh, to their car because they were leaving there, they started all freaking out. And G-Man was like, what, what is it, guys? What is it? And they're like, look, it's the chariots. It's And I kid you not, the euphoria in their voices was very hard to match. I mean, it was just utter, utter euphoria in their voices. The chariots, the chariots. And G-Men's like, I, I don't see it. I don't know what you're talking about. And like he, they're like, look up there. It's confirmation of the chariots. And they all start going, Yahweh, 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 You know, they start doing all that. And uh, he puts it up, and there's just some, like, lights in the sky, you know, which – like lights in the sky could be all kinds of things right <laughs> yeah you're in new york city there's <laughs> lights in the sky but you know they're like you know freaking out that it's and and they viewed it as sort of confirmation that they had done a good job you know that they had done they had done well and uh and so i'm glad that was actually recorded so after we left gms claims that they saw chariots and they view that as a sign that they're ready to come wreck shop on the earth because they don't believe they come from other planets. They believe they come essentially from another dimension. 
So I, most people do think of extraterrestrial like coming from another planet. You got, there is an alternative you, you, you theory. Got, you've got pe- you got people in the chat. You got people in the chat uh, rolling with that. Yeah. So I mean, matter of fact, right here. I mean, probably yeah, interdim- dozens interdimensional. Of comments, yeah. In fact, people that believe this is mainly demonic activity, they hold to an inter. Uh, I believe it's called interdimensional hypothesis, which is they're there. They just they don't show up all the time. And that's what Yahweh claims to be doing, Prophet Yahweh. I hate to say his name, it's blasphemous. But this Prophet Yahweh guy, he claims he can summon them through his prayers. And uh, there's a news clip where he claims to do it in Vegas. And so he, he's a fascinating guy. But uh, we could do anything. We could show uh, you could show their imagery. I could share my screen again. Or we could play a Prophet Yahweh video. What do you want to do? Your, it's your topic, sir. I just want to address one, one comment here before I ever forget this awesome, awesome idea. Uh, Steffi right. Steff. Zombies versus Prophet Muhammad. Ah, uh-huh. well, we could have uh, a zombie could, movie with 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 Muhammad, with Muhammad, have, and the zombies are trying to eat Muhammad, man. Oh, you we, can even you can even have it where like it's the future and the world has been destroyed by Islam, so the government starts a zombie apocalypse during the time of Muhammad to stop him. But then the whole movie is is Muhammad having to defend himself against uh against zombies. Yeah. You could have it um, where uh, you could have it where uh, Muhammad, uh, if he's around, then he uh, he thinks all the all the the alien visitors have revelation for him. <laughs> he thinks everyone everyone's got a revelation for him. Gabriel. <laughs> meet meet me in a cave. <laughs> or you think or you could have like zombie zo- women zombies? He thinks are like his hoodies. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> we could go in a lot of directions with this. All right, it could All be right. Islamic zombies where uh, they're 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 not after people's brains; they're after camel pee. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to protect all the camels or something because they're always trying to go after camels. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Wait. So, uh, wait. What? Muhammad. I got it. I already got the beginning, man. I got the whole beginning. Yeah. Muhammad tells some dudes because they feel sick that they need to drink some camel urine, but it's like. It's like the the bat leading to uh, coronavirus. You know what I mean? They drink yeah. some camel urine out of this contaminated camel, and it turns them into zombies. And that's how the zombie apocalypse starts. People obeying Muhammad's command to drink the camel urine leads to a fight for their very existence. That that's that's too perfect. Get, see, if you get the movie, but then you incorporate all kinds of teachings of Islam that are relevant to the story. That's where things really go well. All right, what Take do you want to do? Take me to your leader. All right, I got my screen up. Can you uh, share? Can you share that? Share it. Is it showing up? I have the technology, and your screen is up. All right, let's show some GMS since we just were talking about GMS. Now we have left Nation of Islam. We're not talking about aliens. We're not talking about Scientologists. We are now speaking about GMS Hebrew Israelites. This is their artwork. In fact, if you look at the bottom left hand corner, you actually see it says GMS down there with several uh, scripture verses on the left hand and the right side. And uh, you can see all that. And this is artwork that they created, okay? And uh, I'm going to zoom in on a part here, okay? I'm going to zoom in, and I want to show you. These guys do make a pretty funny artwork. I, I see that guy with a sword and, a, and holding a severed head. <laughs> yeah, that, of course David Wood thinks that's funny. <laughs> wait, wait, did, did, did you go down to the bottom? You see the one guy who's got who's got this dude around the throat. Yeah, yeah. I always call him. I always he's call got, him a little Timmy. He's got. Call him, he's got his giant fist around that dude's throat. These guys are awesome. <laughs> yeah, I always call him. Like I said, I always call that guy little Timmy. Poor little Timmy. Yeah. So, so he's he's got a, around his throat there because because they believe that's what they're gonna do uh, to the to the other nations when they come back. Now, interesting, David. Um, do you see the two buildings in the background? Oh yeah, twin towers. Yeah, they've got the twin towers. So now uh, I don't know if this was made before or after nine eleven because they may be saying you thought that was bad. We're going to be destroying all your skyscrapers, Esau. You know what I mean? Huh, yeah. Or they may be they're saying this is prior to nine eleven, but I kind of doubt that because that looks like the nine eleven uh, images or something. But these these spaceships here on your screen, if you look closely. Do you know what movie they're from? Especially huh. this big one right here. It's 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 photoshopped from a movie. Is that a? No, that's not that's not a that's not the Will Smith In... one, right? That's it's yep, it's Independence Day. Oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one. Randy Quaid flew up into one of those. 
Yep. Exactly. Oh, look, they got two, t t two twin towers. So it's all of Esau's buildings in the background there. But look at this guy. He has a really large sword, like way bigger than his body. And, uh, you know, he's got this large fist. And if you notice in the background, do you notice? I don't know if you can see it how well. Do you see there's beams coming down and there's people in the beams of the spaceships? Oh, yeah, yeah. Here's why. See a blue beam. They believe that the lake of fire is thermonuclear destruction across, uh, upon America. And so what's going to happen is there's going to be a ship – ostensibly the mothership because it's blasting from its center uh, a giant laser ray that will be destroying uh, America while Hebrew Israelites are getting beamed up like Scotty in, in, in a landing party. They're getting beamed up to be saved from the destruction. And while that's happening, other Hebrew Israelites are going to be taking part in the destruction and be killing wicked Gentiles. So that's th – this is – this this image is essentially their eschatology. Pretty cool. And you notice how uh, UFO-centric it is. Uh, extremely so. But here, we'll go to the next one. It, it, it'll be funny if that, that dude that he's got around the throat, they just put, like, some random team jersey on, like he's wearing, like, a Baltimore Ravens jersey or something like that, and the <laughs> dude's Baltimore. got him around the throat. Baltimore and that would, that would, like, that would like convince all the Pittsburgh Steelers fans to, you know, support support the, the Hebrews. <laughs> like. That's just what I was thinking when I saw that. So here is Yahawashai. So this is, uh, you know, Black Jesus, Yahawashai. He's got a, a red uh, sword and he has the eyes, not just because he's angry, but because uh, he is equipped with laser beams out of his eyes, just like Christopher Reeve. And what's going to happen is uh, the Hebrews lie to our elect or chosen will also be granted this power when Yahawashai comes back. And so they will be zapping Edomites together with laser beams out of their eyes. So there's multiple levels of destruction that are going to be visiting upon America, according to Revelation 18 and the Hebrews Lights eschatology. So th the question is, if I'm uh, if I'm actually a, a Jake, then I I'll be I'll be shooting out of my eyeballs with lasers too, right? Yes. Yes, if I could uh, say a PG-13 word just for the point of proving it. Uh, one time Tahar told uh, me through video, he said, now vocab, we don't know if you're an Israelite or not, but if you are, you're going to be, along with us, kicking those heathens' ass, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and so, it's your yes. It's your destiny. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is your destiny. Yeah, so that is that is really what he, he told me, bro. And so you've got it figured out. Now, here's Yahawashai on the cross. Now, it just looks like Yahawashai on the cross, but uh, you see the GMS logo on the bottom left. But look in the background. I see, I see the spaceship. There's a chariot. And in the background, it's not just it's not just Yahweh Shai's crucifixion. There's also a chariot present at the event. Okay, now switching over to uh, another camp uh, that's supposed to be uh, more respectable than GMS. I'm saying that's the way they promote themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think GMS, to be frank with you, is just more honest, and I actually prefer GMS over IUIC any day. But here's IUIC, though those beginning ones were all GMS. This is IUIC. Now, here you've got uh, the man with the shofar horn calling down, apparently, or maybe because it's the war uh, thing, the UFO. So it's like a <laughs> and then here comes the spaceship. <laughs> the rapture is only for the Israelites. <laughs> uh, so uh, they're getting caught up, beamed into the spaceships, but ain't nobody else doing it. And the crazy thing is, what they think is the elect will get caught up in the spaceships while the two-thirds, so like the renegade jakes, mm -hmm. they're actually going to get destroyed if they're if they're wicked. But it's when they come back in the kingdom that they'll be able to then be restored, and then they'll be beating up the other nations. So if you're not one of the elect, you won't be taking part in the initial destruction. I should clarify that statement from earlier. But when the kingdom is there, then you'll be able to beat up on the other nations. But as Tahar says, you might have to go through the first 1,000 years without an eye. And I, I kid you not, that's what he says. He's like, you might be missile food. You might have to go through out with a leg or, or an arm, but then you'll be restored later on because they believe in an ethnic universalism. Now, this is just One West-style Hebrewism. This is not all Hebrewites. This is specifically the One West camps. Mm-hmm. Now I want to go back to the old school one, David. This is old school Hebrews like imagery going way back. Yeah, the the, the, the artwork the artwork is uh I mean that's clearly someone just drew that rather than like you know making right. it on on like uh you know Photoshop or something. 
Yeah, so that's 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 back in the day, right? This shows how how far back this goes. And the rumor is, according to the the old school heads, is what they say. They say that a particular man who was one of the seven heads, that's what they call their leaders, started bringing in the work by a, an author with the last name of Stitchin. And Stitchin is kind of following in the heels of Von Daniken and brought in a lot of these other crazy theories. And that's how he, that's everything he does. There's actually a website called StitchinIsWrong.com, which was uh, actually initiated by Heiser himself. It's a good website and debunks a lot of Stitchin stuff. But they were influenced by Stitchin. And uh, so they've got into this UFO stuff real heavy. And there's the chariots. And if you notice, there's 12 people there. So those are the 12 tribes of Israel with Yahawashai in the middle. And if you look closely at his hand, uh, Yahawashai, that's black Jesus, he's actually uh, shooting a Iron Man magneto-like yeah. laser beam at white Jesus there. White Jesus with the sacred heart. He is blasting him for real. And uh, everybody else got their swords out, right? And if you look, the devil and the pope are on both sides of Jesus, as well as a Jew and apparently an American businessman, perhaps a young Donald Trump. And then there's a, sort of a Greco-Roman guy on the right side. So they're getting at all their enemies is the idea here, right? And uh, pretty bizarre, but it shows how it goes back. Uh, you know, salvation of the lost tribes of Israel, the twelve. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But I can't, I can't yeah, wait. It's hey, hey, if you look, uh, if you look uh, all the way on the right. Of oh, those twelve dudes, all, all the way on the right. Second from the second from the right. That's a white dude. That might be me if I grow my hair out. Well, so remember the twelve tribes have people like Cubans mm -hmm. and uh, and Dominicans and Puerto Ricans and Seminole Indians and, and, and Mexicans. People who just kind of look white like me. Yep, and so that could be one of the guys from those tribes. See the guy in the headdress right beside Yahawashai? By the way, it's funny. Jesus is supposed to be 30, 33. They make him look like he's 85. You know, here's Jesus all old looking. But uh, the guy next to him, if you notice, he has a war bonnet on. Yeah. So that would be someone from Gad or Reuben. <clears throat> so this just shows how the one West Hebrews lights how, you know, are pretty steeped in this. And look, they updated the picture. Oh, nice. And if you look in the bottom, they still got white Jesus being blasted by Yahawashai, but it's Jim Caviezel's head. And they got a... Uh... And they got uh, the American flag and the Statue of Liberty burning. Uh, what do you would you say this is what SNES graphics, Super Nintendo era graphics style, or maybe a little bit after? Uh, yeah, it's it's you know it's better it's better than uh than the original Nintendo, but not as good as now. And then you got some more kind of pixelated stuff, but it just gives you a sense of the imagery. Some of it's pretty epic. This is probably one of my favorite ones. I mean, there's just a lot to look at here. Uh, I'm going to go back to that one. I'm going to see how many more we have. And then, okay, jeez, man. It's That's quite a bit. Yeah, I know. It's kind of epic, right, in a way. I mean, look, you guys riding a chariot. You got these guys. You got... This is probably my favorite one, though. You know. <clears throat> so, Greetings. Uh, <laughs> Take us to your stuff. It must yeah. be some good drugs. Uh, this guy's more like, uh, where's the president of the United States? And because uh, that's who he's going after. So, I mean, you get an idea there. Do you have a question about any of those? I'm just showing you the UFO iconography. We probably got to wind down here. And maybe if we ever do this again, there's other stuff I could show because we're not going to get to. Today. But, David, we have not told people to subscribe to my channel. They need to. Yeah, the right? uh, link to Vocab's channel if you're interested in aliens. <laughs> I hardly ever talk about this stuff. <laughs> if if the only thing that you're interested in is aliens and religion, then subscribe to Vocab's channel because he covers that all day, every day. And so, uh, no, Vocab, uh, why don't you tell them the, the stuff you normally cover on your uh, on your channel? And the link to Vocab's channel is in the description box. Right now, we are airing on the channel the special edition of Islamicize Me. So if you guys haven't seen it in a while, it's been two years since it's out, you want to come because we're premiering it. Because when we first did it on your channel, David, we couldn't premiere it. You just had to upload it, and then everybody would comment immediately on it, which was fun. Now, everybody, we can watch it together. So you can watch Islamicize Me together on my channel, youtube.com slash vocab alone. And we're like on day 23. And that's going to be important here in a second. I'll tell you why. But so subscribe because I cover stuff on Islam, including airing Islamicize me. Plus, as you could tell, Hebrew Israelites, I do a lot of live streaming about them. I do this thing called the Smoke Room. I just got done doing it today where I take anyone to call me on Skype and I just talk to them. Uh, so that's kind of fun. And Sometimes you, I free. And then you get smoked. Yeah, I get smoked. That's exactly what the Hebrew Israelites say, by the way. And then I sometimes do freestyles. Um, and those are just to be fun. You know, we do urban apologetics. We just kind of have fun with that. 
and and then I cover uh, Islam, Hebrew Islamism, and then some alternative urban religions as well. So a little bit of Nation of Islam, and a little bit of comedic stuff. That's the guys who are really in, into Egypt and whatnot. And um, then I just do Bible studies. Mm -hmm. So like this Wednesday, I'm just going to be doing a Bible study on Mal Malachi three, the the passage about the infamous, uh, you know. Uh, the prosperity preachers use, they misuse it, about robbing God and pro being prosperous and blessing. We're going to look at the context of what that means and really just do an in-depth study of Malachi 3. And the next Wednesday, we're going to do another Bible study of Malachi 3. So kind of just biblical theology stuff. I do a lot of book reviews as well, we'll go through a book together. Lately, I've been doing stuff on dismantling pro-Confederate myths, which some people have had a problem with. But I've been doing it, and uh, no, it's not because, a, but not, not because I'm a Marxist or anything like that, but uh, I think it's important to to understand uh, the truth about this. So I've been looking at that. So a variety of things, but really focus on Hebrew Israelites, number one, Islam, number two. And then every now and then we get into atheism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Roman Catholic. We should, uh, we, should, uh, we, should do something on, we should do something on uh, on the Confederate stuff one night. Oh, I've got some great stuff. Maybe we could Maybe we could do that for... I wish I could get together once a month. With you. Maybe we can do it at the end of this month or, or early August. If you're down, bro, I got some uh, stuff on it. Might have to find someone to balance it out because I'm going to tell people what I think about those rebels. <laughs> <laughs> Rebel scum. Just kidding. That's uh, that's Star Wars. So, yeah, that's the kind of stuff. But I bring it all back to saying Islamicize me. Check this out. Mm -hmm. And you know this, David, because we're going to talk about this Tuesday. Day 23 of Islamicize me has been banned from my channel. So the editor uploaded it to the channel. And YouTube struck it down. I submitted appeal. The repeal was rejected. And I, what I said is, this is satire. And I even try to speak the language. This is satire designed to educate people to become anti-racist. And I went this because this particular issue shows the anti-Semitic views of certain aspects of Islam. And so what they do is we confront Hebrew Israelites for real on the street as Muslims. If you've seen Islam size me, you know it. Well, YouTube is, is, is giving me my first community strike and not letting it run on my channel. So here's what we're doing. This Tuesday, David, you and I are going to talk about it and show some clips, I think, and, and discuss it briefly and, and about sort of all that kind of stuff together. And then that next Thursday, I am airing day 23, the Snowflake Edition. So every time that they say – that our characters say anything that we think YouTube might have given us a strike for, <laughs> we do things like beep it out and then put a little YouTube logo over their mouth. Oh, that's smart. Yes. And so we're, it's literally – a and we're retitling it and everything. So it's day 23, <clears throat> Snowflake Edition. So that's this Thursday. You'll see how we're trying to please the YouTube masters, and then you and I, David, are going to talk about it this Tuesday. So that's what's popping on my channel. D D uh, uh, D New says uh, it was the best episode of Islamicize Me. Um, that was that was definitely up there, guys. Guys, you got to understand how funny this is, right? the The idea of Islamicize Me is that we're some atheists who converted to Islam on a kind of challenge that was supposed to show us that Islam is true, but we don't know anything, and so our characters by day 23 realize that their enemies are the jews so they go to find the to find the true jews but the hebrew israelites are the ones claiming to be the true jews so you have this this showdown between our characters and real hebrew israelites real hebrew israelites who are standing on the street and we end up uh outraged at them because we're showing them from from islam sources that muhammad is like the whitest dude around and so how can you guys say that, you know, the kingdom isn't for white people when Muhammad is the whitest dude in Arabia? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's actually us on a street in Phoenix in front of a group of Hebrew Israelites with us fully dressed as Muslims. And those Hebrew Israelites totally, totally punked out. Like they didn't know what to do with Muslims, right? They're probably used to, used to interacting with, with Christians and stuff. They had no idea what to do when, when a group of of uh, mm -hmm. people dressed in full Islamic gear rolled up on us. So they just completely ignored us as we challenged them to their faces. Wow. Yeah, they, they said nothing. I mean, IUIC, probably, man. IUIC, totally punked out on that one. Yep, Israel united in cowardice. And so by the end, you know, I was calling them cowards. So if you want to watch Islamicize Me Day 23, the original version, it is on a certain channel. I don't know if I want to name it because I don't want to get that channel in trouble. And it's on a couple other places in YouTube as well. So you mm -hmm. can see it online. Just put Islamicize Me Day 23. Not on my channel, though. 
So I'm retitling mine, putting out this edited version, the Snowflake edition, and um, we'll see if it if 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 it's okay, because it's clearly not hate speech. We are we are mocking and satirizing anti-Semitism to educate people through humor and comedy. But my appeal got rejected, yeah. and so uh, I it's, encourage it's, it's everyone funny. to you, upload. You, we are we are we are making fun of the hate speech yeah. that two ideologies would put out against each other. We're making fun yes. of it, and then YouTube basically said, in effect, you can't make you can't make fun of it. You can't make fun of the, the yeah. You can, <laughs> and, well, and they don't tell funny. you, you know, what is considered going against the community guidelines. So you know, um, we have different ways that we sort of strike back, and um, and way I'm going to strike back is I'm literally editing out anything that I think would be offensive. Mainly, uh, the main guess is they are not understanding the satire or not wanting to, and so all the satire that that is making fun of racism, we're bleeping out. I think it's funny. It's over the top. It, 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 you have to understand the context, I think, to get it. But it's going to air this Thursday, and we're going to talk about it Tuesday. So I'm looking forward to it. So that's why you get to subscribe to the channel, man. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yo, uh, yeah, it's about so. uh, it's about nine forty here. Want to take okay. some? Uh, just take some comments for about 15, 20 minutes, and then close out. Um, yeah, let's I'll, end I'll go ahead and because uh, we got super chats going back to the beginning. I don't think I've responded to any of the super chats. You just look for any 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 uh, comments that you want to respond to, and I'll I will pull up super chats as well. Yeah, um, Sarah ha Hagee, uh, you guys rock! Shout out to her for a super chat for sure. Um, uh, Abu Apu Bakker Al Puff Daddy said, "Howdy, Mr. Malone and Dr. Wood. Dr. Wood, your video on the five types of law enforcement officers was very informative, enlightening, and inspirational. What kind of reaction have you gotten from law enforcement officers, ex-cons, etc.? Would you testify in Congress on police reform bills? Um, I'd be happy to testify on anything I know about. I, I don't think I'm going to be getting invited. But uh, no, the, the, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive from both uh, ex-cons from people who work in prisons and from correctional officers and from police officers. There, there are a couple of people who, there are a couple of people who, you know, said, oh, you're, you're justifying hostility against police officers. And then at the other extreme was, you know, you didn't go far enough in, in calling things out. But the, the yeah, the overwhelming majority of people, uh, whether, whether on the, on the ex-con side or the ex-con side or, or law enforcement side were saying, you're right on the money, and those those are the kinds of people that that we have all encountered. So, so yeah, almost everyone. You can read through the comments. Almost everyone, almost everyone agrees with me. Yeah, uh, I heard tons of good feedback about that, and I, I really like that that uh, that video you did as well. It was a super interesting perspective. That was really good. <sighs> I agree. It was pretty dope. Yeah, it's funny because it was long one of your longer ones, but I think people were like really engrossed with it. I don't think they even realized how long it was. Like they're like, wait, this has been almost an hour. A lot of people said that. A lot of people said, oh, yeah. I thought it was ten minutes. Yeah, so that's that's cool, man. That was that was dope, man. I think it was unique. You know, I mean, we didn't, we haven't talked about this. Did you see? Because uh, you talk about doing some of the South. Did you see? And and in cops, this is why I'm reminded. Those guys uh, out there at Stone Mountain in Georgia, the armed black militia. No. The name of the group was NFAC, which stands for not censored around coalition not effing around coalition right so these dudes uh went out to stone mountain where the re reinvigorated re version of the kkk was founded and at stone mountain they have like the confederate version of mount rushmore it's like lee jackson and uh, davis and they're all like carved in the side of the mountain so they went out there right mm -hmm. and they and they they march and it's like hundreds of dudes like more than you ever saw the black panthers doing the reason why I mention all that is I it's first of all, it's interesting. It's fascinating. Right. Uh, this like black militia. You don't see that every day. Right. But the guy begins his speech with a bunch of Hebrew Israelite stuff. But then later on, they start they chant some Islamic stuff. So it's like this a real weird, weird syncretist. Yeah, yeah. But I did a video on it. I don't, you should look into it. I think you would find it fascinating mm. uh, if you look at it. Very, uh, it was a very fascinating thing. This just happened. Uh, Fourth of July weekend. Hmm. Before I have a Fourth of July. And I did a show on it. But uh, yeah, it. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah was, people were asking if i'm on BitChute. not really uh i've just started a mines account but i haven't uploaded anything 
And I just got on Parler, but I'm just sitting there. I'm not doing anything yet. Right now, I'm still using Twitter yeah. Yo, you and should, Facebook and you all should, that stuff. You, you might want to check out Parler. Um, I'm on there. I just no, 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 no. I'm saying you might want to check it out because uh, uh, a, bu- a bunch of Christian apologists went over there. Um, but yeah, I'm getting more interactions on Parler than I was on Twitter, even though I had way more um, way more followers on Twitter. So I'm just wondering if if they if Twitter actually sandbags your stuff. You know what I mean? If they hold your stuff back. So you might want to check it out and see. Uh, and see what happens. Um, all right, a couple comments. Hindu historian says, if sapient life, if sapient alien life exists, would the sun need to die on all planets hosting such life to redeem God's imperfect creation on those planets? Um, not sure, because we're not told. Uh, any thoughts on that, Voca? Basically, they would need to be saved as well. Is that what he's saying? Uh, uh, yeah, whether he would, uh, I, I guess... If Jesus would have to sort of, be, I mean, if the sun would have to become incarnate on all those planets in order right, to yeah, die yeah. for them over and over again, something like that. But yeah, I agree with those kinds of, now I, we understand Carl Sagan is not taking that in consideration. I mean, he's dead now, but, but, but for the Christian, they really, they really need to, they really need to think about the cosmic uh, implications and all that. And and I agree. I exact I agree. So like uh, there's problems there. In fact, Paul Davies, who uh, seems like he wants there to be extraterrestrial life, but yeah, he's, recognizes uh, yeah, he's, pretty, he's pretty cool. He talks a lot about fine tuning and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Mind of God book. Mm-hmm. He does have a quote though that basically says, "Look, uh, he brings that exact kind of thing up, and he says, look, if there is extraterrestrial life, if there is this, the idea of like the Christian God it becomes very silly very fast." Uh, I'm paraphrasing Davies here, but he recognizes like it's going to become really silly uh, if that's the case. And so, uh, and I, I agree. Uh, yeah, I have an email, uh, Aaron, uh, vocabmalone at gmail.com, vocabmalone at gmail.com. Technically right says almost all of the UFO sightings in the Cold War were experimental U.S. aircraft. The U-2 spy plane was infamous for causing sightings. Mm-hmm. Um, EB's dual dualism says, I believe that God has made beings in his image on myriad worlds. I believe that the fall, however, only affected humans on this planet and that those other children uh have never come here aliens we encounter are demons so that that would be interesting if uh you did have aliens on other planets but they didn't uh they didn't experience the fall or something like that um sgt low says if i pray to asteroids if i pray to asteroids will aliens give me a flying horse slash human hybrid (laughs) Um, I don't know. I mean, I hear what people are saying, but uh, some of you guys, I mean, not to be rude, but you're just speculating. I know, I know the last person's joking, yeah. but you're like, well, you know, there's aliens, but they haven't visited us. Well, well then what would be the evidence for these aliens? Mm-hmm. I mean, I hear you. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but they're made in God's image and they exist. Well, why do you think that? Because it seems like you're saying contactees are not experiencing them. You're saying contactees are experiencing demonic interaction. But first of all, I really think we need to stop and say, all are, are all these people who claim to be contactees, are they actually contactees? Mm-hmm. I really challenge the notion that they are properly reporting. Because a lot of the stuff you look at, it is clear they are not. It's just rot with, with uh, people changing their stories and not answering all kinds of wacky stuff, right? So, uh, But you're saying it's demons. I do agree there could be some of that going on. No doubt about that, right? But then you look at it, it's like, then why do you think there's stuff on, why do you think there, what makes you say there's people on, or people on, whatever they are on these other planets? Mm-hmm. I just, what would be the evidence, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't think Christians need to fight about this. Don't get me wrong. I'm just tr- trying to, you know, figure this out. Because, David, this does get into big questions. Like, are we alone in the universe? But see, Christians, we don't think we're alone in the universe. I mean, obviously, God our creator, but even just taking outside of that, angels and demons are real. So angels are non-physical beings, and so are demons. So they're real, but they don't have a physical reality to them. Now there's some debate, can they, can they manifest themselves? And if they do, in what way are they manifesting? So we're not against the idea there could be persons who are not humans. Because if aliens exist and are intelligent, I think that we would need to recognize they're persons, but they're not humans. We have that with angels and demons, right? Persons, that doesn't mean human, though. So that's a reality, okay. But what would be the evidence for for these 
ET like beings or whatever they would be. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Phil Fox for the super chat. That's the homie, by the way. Subscribe to him too. Yeah, he says, Hey Dizzle, thanks for having the coolest cat in apologetics on tonight. Farrakhan? <laughs> Farrakhan? Farrakhan? Yeah, see, Andrew Schnick, Roswell was a U.S. Army operation to have a disc mic on a weather balloon. The U.S. have messed up on terminology. Uh, is that the same person from earlier? It sounds like they know what they're talking about. Because if you look at some of these pictures, some of these people drew back then, uh, they're disc shaped. Uh, what? I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Delta shaped, like that, like that wing kind of angle. And then we know for a fact different governments, including our own, were experimenting with aircraft of that shape. We know for a fact they were experimenting with a delta type wing, that triangular. And so it's just you have people then drawing it, saying, "Here's what I saw." Mm. Yeah. Far, take the wheel. Uh, Brenda says, uh, I love both of your channels. Thanks and God bless you. Coco JC4E says, uh, thank you so much, brothers. Annette Leo Aries says, what's up, the Vatican's observatory? I don't know what that means. I just know they got some good astronomers there. Oh, the, is, is that what the Vatican's observatory is? They like uh, monitoring the universe or? Yeah, I don't know the details, but I, my understanding is they have their own, and they have some top line astronomers there. Uh, you would imagine they would. Who was it? I think Polkinghorn. Oh, was he there? Not, I think that's where he came from. If I'm not mistaken, we have to look that up. So don't, no one quote me, please. But I believe so. I think Polkinghorn. That I think that's what he was. I think he was a Vatican. So I know they got some real guys. You know, they're a long ways from the days of Galileo. Mm -hmm. When uh, even if I look and <laughs> I'm still not going to believe, you know, they've come a long way since those days. Um, actually, that's a myth. They weren't like that. About to jump through this screen. I, I've been wanting to make a video for years about what, what really, what, <laughs> about the, uh, the, uh, the Galileo affair. I know there's a myth involved, but I've also seen some stupid stubbornness on the part of Rome during that affair. No, they, be did. Willing to, they did. They did. The, yeah, but it, it's a uh, yeah. So so as far as the rulings that were that were handed out, if you read them, it's just, yes, we condemn you for this. But if you if you look closer, you had like this uh, this battle brewing between the Jesuits and the Dominicans and they're taking sides and they're both doing power plays on who's being weakest against the Protestants. And then you've got someone like Galileo in there saying, I don't need you guys to interpret the Bible for me. Uh, I can go do what I want. And then everyone, there's a lot of politics. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it was, it's massively political. In fact, the when when Galileo finally gets condemned, the, the Pope was his buddy. The Pope was his buddy. He thought, cool, I'm good to go. He went and brought his book to the Pope. The Pope said, yeah, you can publish that. Sure, no problem. And then he goes, as long as, as long as you include uh, this one thing in your book, just acknowledge that, you know, it's possible that, that none of these particular theories is right. And there could be some other theory that explains the stuff even better than this, because we don't, we don't have all the data and we can't, we don't have, you know, God's perspective on this, which he turned out to be, the Pope there was absolutely correct, right? Because you had the Ptolemaic system and you had the, uh, you had, you had the Ptolemaic system and then you had the, the heliocentric system. And they were both wrong, right? The heliocentric system was 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 closer, but the, you know that that system, you know that according to that system, the sun is at the center of the entire universe, and everything's going everything's going around the sun. And weren't they also basing stuff off of like Aristotelian logic that things have to be perfect circles, so they didn't take yeah, into they, account yeah, yeah, the, they were, uh, elliptical aspects of the orbits or something like that? They were they were they were all they were all kind they were all kinds of messed up. And the Pope just said, hey, basically, don't say that this theory is definitely correct. Just say, hey, you know, we don't have access to ultimate causes of things. And, you know, and so Galileo put that quotation in there, but he puts it in the mouth of the biggest idiot in the book. Right. And, the, and so he has the idiot say this looking like a, making the Pope look like a moron. Yeah, he made it, the character of the idiot in his book be the Pope, basically. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, the, the Pope, the Pope flipped out. The Inquisition was going to give. Um, was going to give Galileo a little slap on the wrist. He was just going to have to sign a document saying I inadvertently broke this broke this agreement that I had made years ago on on not teaching this stuff as uh, as fact. And uh, the Pope said, nope, not after not after that, Bud Rowe. And so, uh, yep, got into got into so and and he had violated an agreement that he had signed years earlier not to not to teach this stuff as as fact. And so yes, part um, of it was Galileo's fault. He was uh, he well, was quite he yeah. he Galileo was brilliant, but he, the the thing he was best at, even better than astronomy, was trash talking. And so 
he was just like constantly making enemies because he had like contempt for so many people and he's always burning them up. So anyway, he basically spends his career making enemies, doing awesome stuff. But as soon as they had a chance for some get back, man, they got some get back on, on him. And he, even the Pope ain't whoa. Galileo ain't yeah. whoa. And uh, there's a, there's a, there's a quotation. There's a quotation somewhere. Gosh, I forget who it is. Um, there's a quotation somewhere that says, you know, for the atheists who are claiming this perpetual warfare between science and religion, it's, it's interesting that the best example you can give is a guy who's put on house arrest. Yeah, that, that, that was the ultimate. You, you, you go live in your in your in your beautiful sprawling house for <laughs> you live out your days there, Galileo. And that was like the ultimate oh. example of this endless warfare between I uh between think, science and religion. I think now it's evident that you are clearly a Jesuit plant. Yes, I've heard that. I hear that all the time. You know why? Because I went to a Jesuit school. Jesuit whoa. whoa, whoa. Uh, Marilyn Murphy says uh, it's Uncle Martin from My Favorite Martian. Do you, do you remember that? Do you ever see My Favorite Martian? I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. It, it had a, I forget the guy's name. It was Mr. Hand from uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Was uh, was my favorite Martian. Oh, I remember. I remember him. He was the guy fighting uh, Spicoli, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he was. He he was on a. It was like old show, black and white. Kara said people would rather believe in melon heads than God. <laughs> What is it? Talking talk about name? aliens, I think, with giant melon heads. Oh, right, right, right. yeah, yeah. The Greys. Yeah. Uh, the Greys. Sarah yeah. Heggie says, uh, you guys rock. And um, Annette, Annette Leo Aries says, off topic, but could you guys please do a live chat about sleep paralysis sometime? Uh, I know nothing about sleep paralysis, so that might be might be better for someone who I don't, has to deal I, with that. Yeah, not quite our... Not I quite don't our not quite down our, our street there. LD says, the U.S. government has released military footage of UFOs. Footage seems legit. Yeah, just, just to recap, we have no problem with the idea of UFOs. It's the explanation of, it's the explanation that we would be skeptical about, right? Whatever you're, yes. whatever you're saying, whatever you, if you're, you know, if you see a UFO and you conclude aliens, well, we, we need to see some further information there because we know right. that we know that governments work on things that, that we don't know about. And so we'd want some, some good reason to think that this is actually, you know, aliens or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, uh, it is unidentified, right? But just because it's not explained, does not mean that it's uh, not explainable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, look, uh, uh, we don't have to answer this, but we got a Hebrew Israelite here, Lion's Den of Yasharala. Nice. What are the What are the seven weeks, Beavis and Butthead? <laughs> These guys are awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, cool. <laughs> uh, go ahead. You got one. What was this question? Uh, the, what are the seven oh. weeks? Yeah. Uh, hey Beavis, what are the seven weeks? <clears throat> That's about as good as I can do off the off the top. Maybe of I can use it for TV. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> um, let's see. William James says, uh, "I have never seen UFOs, and I really never believed in them. They are a conspiracy theory." Um, that's possible, but I would even want to see a good case for conspiracy. That's what I mean. Like, like uh, I don't normally go in. For, I mentioned this earlier. I don't normally go in for conspiracy theories uh, or alien sightings. And so mm -hmm. I, I guess just, you know, if I had to pick one, I'd go with conspiracy theory and so on. The point is, if you grant that aliens are possible and that alien visitations are possible, then you'd say, I want, you know, I, I want to see some good evidence before giving up my stamp of approval. By the way, I, when I'm in discussions with atheists, I use this. As an example, they're like, how can you believe in a miracle? How can you believe it? It's so ridiculous. I use alien I use alien sightings as an example um, to explain why I believe in the resurrection in the sense that you've got all these people who are willing to die for their claim that they uh, saw a man who had risen from the dead, right? If uh, if all I knew that were that was that some people claimed that they heard that a guy r rose from the dead. I wouldn't think that was a tremendous amount of evidence. But when they're willing to go to their horrible bloody deaths for their claim that 
they saw someone who had risen from the dead, then I've got something I need to explain because they clearly believe it. And so the question is, what could convince these guys that they had seen a man risen from the dead? So all these, you know, claims that, you know, hey, I got sucked up into a ship and these aliens probed me for three days and then returned me to my farm. Uh, very skeptical of, of those kinds of claims. But if someone were to say, you know, if someone with 10 or 12 of his friends were you know, came up to me and said, hey, you know, we got sucked up into a ship and we were there for three days. We we're we we're there together. And um, and then we the aliens brought us back and I didn't believe them. And I was like really, really obsessed with shutting them down. And I start blowing their brains out. Say, hey, admit that you're lying. And I start blowing their brains out. And 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 all of them say, we saw it, man. You can kill us if you want. But but that's what we saw. Then I would start believing. OK, these guys really are convinced that they were abducted and were taken up into a into an alien spacecraft. So how do I how do I explain that level of confidence? What could have happened to these guys to convince them that they were abducted by aliens and taken up into a into a spacecraft? There I'd have something to explain where I don't if it's just some guy saying it. Um, you know, good point. And also uh, with a aliens doing anal probing, you got to <laughs> wonder, like, why travel all across the yeah. galaxy just that, to look at some farmer's I mean. butt? That's, and after you've seen one butt, haven't you kind of seen them all? Like, why are they still probing people's butts? Yeah, that's uh, what's the what? Yeah, that again, that goes back to my my thinking when I was, you know, a kid. It's wait, right, you you flew across this universe to stick this, you know, to stick this glass thing in this guy's arm or to, uh, you know, to probe some dude's butt. Um, seems like you could of all the things you could fly across the galaxy for i mean it seems like you could come up with something better to do when you uh when you got here take me, take me to your rectum <laughs> sorry man instead of taking to your leader bro cheryl, yeah, but for real that is a good point though cheryl r with the super sticker mr phil fox says dizzle thanks for adding me to your mod crew i will uh try and serve you well blessings to this ministry um let's see I think. <laughs> yeah, maybe the aliens are like Sir Mix a lot. <laughs> they like big butts and they cannot <laughs> lie. Did someone say that? <laughs> Somebody said something like that. Noob artist. <laughs> yeah. yeah hey, so, so, some people are funny in the comments. Like like earlier earlier today, I made a video, and it's called uh, "What I Like About Muhammad." But then at the end of the video, I said, uh, "Let me know in the comments section." what you like about Muhammad. And now I have to make a totally separate video out of the, the funny comments about all the, the people saying what they like about Muhammad. So now I get to say, you know, what non-Muslims like about Muhammad and then mm. just uh, go through all the comments. So it's a... Uh... Oh, speaking of all that stuff, because that just brought into my mind um, before he went to mosque and Aisha washed him down. I don't know why I thought that. But but uh, we put together uh, for Islamicize Me as well, David, a a super cut of all the bloopers we got so far. Oh yeah, and it's it's also going to air on the channel uh, this week. It's super funny. It's all the best bloopers, as well as that deleted scene is thrown in there as well. So I don't know if you have any other uh, bloopers scene, other ones you sent me, but it's I a have really a, good I have super a, cut. I have a bunch on SD cards somewhere. At some point, we're just going to have to take because th those are SD cards I'm never erasing. At some point, we'll just have to sit there, go through all the footage, and see what we want to. Uh, see what we want to keep from all that stuff i got a guy i got a guy oh to go through all that stuff yeah yes but oh. anyways all right man well we've been going uh two hours so i think Let's we'll go, go ahead and sign off now uh remind everyone again when we are going to be live this Tuesday, you this and I Tuesday. on my channel, youtube.com slash vocabulary. Thank you, Cheryl R., for dropping the link there in the chat. We're going to talk about the banned episode of Day 23 as well as sort of Islamicize Me in general and, and some of the, the those kind of reactions as we look back the past two years. And then on Thursday, I'm going to actually do the Snowflake edition of Day 23. And then the, the bloopers are coming out as well. And so – that but yeah you and i'll be on there tuesday so hopefully everybody subscribes to the channel so they can know when you're coming on we'll probably do it around eight o'clock east coast it should be a, a good time because that's when the episode was supposed to air was this tuesday so instead we're going to talk about why it's not airing and uh, that should be fascinating and when we do the boom boom room again i think we should do one that's got an alien in it as well as justice my dog those two Creatures, I think Muhammad needs to eat. I just want to say that before we leave. Muhammad meets a dog. Uh, 
Last comment I'll take. Marek says, uh, who are your favorite uh, faith and science apologists? Um, I like, uh, yeah, I like a couple of the, um, you know, the the cosmologist guys like, uh, you know, um, uh, Robin Collins and so on. And, and I like a lot of the, the intelligent design guys like uh, Dembski and Meyer and so on. So, yep. Um, my, matter of fact, uh, matter of fact should, should try and get some of these guys on at some point to uh, to discuss some things. Go ahead. Yeah, you should, yeah. Uh, Paul Nelson, he's more of a philosopher of science, but I love what he has to say. I think he's great. He did some stuff at uh, Biola and Talbot for a while. He was an expelled. Paul Nelson's one writer I really like. Kurt Wise, who's actually trained, believe it or not, at Harvard and University of Chicago, partially under Stephen J. Gould which is crazy if you think about it. Kurt Wise is uh, an another one. He's one of the few guys Dawkins called a, an honest creationist, as it were. And then actually you mentioned him as well, Stephen Meyer. I just think he's so good at explaining a variety of things and I like the way he puts together a team. And uh, I love hearing his debates. The few times he's been able to get one of these guys to debate him. And um, uh, be he as well. And uh, what's that? what's that new guy's name? My brain is fried right now because I didn't uh, sleep much right now. He came up with the, gosh, it was all on proteins. His book was on. I don't know. His don't book know. is on proteins. The guy's a, yeah, the guy's a, the guy's a biologist. Anyway, uh, hmm. Behe, Behe is cool because uh, I was a, I was a biology major. I was a double major in biology and philosophy, but uh, hmm. I can say he had some people shook. They, they can all say, oh, this is so stupid. This uh, intelligent design nonsense is so stupid. Behind closed doors, he had a lot of people in biology shook with uh, with some of his arguments. They're going, "Yeah, mm. that is that is the way to go. That is the way to go if you really wanted to wanted to shake confidence in in atheism." So yeah, uh, matter of fact, I might need to start making some videos on that stuff. I I might need to put my biology degree to some use at some point in my life. Totally, I didn't know you were a double major. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'd have to. Yeah, du yeah, uh, yeah. Ramon said Douglas Axe. Yeah, I remember the Doug. But uh, couldn't remember the last Oh, yeah. Section. Douglas He's Axe, really, yeah. really, really smart guy. Yeah. Protein. Oh, and let me mention a couple of astronomers I like. Danny Faulkner. Uh, he's been good debunking the uh, flat earthers out there, which some people are going to get upset now they said that. I like Danny Faulkner a lot. Uh, I think he teaches, uh, he got his degree from one of the uh, South Carolina school there. And uh, he actually does some stuff on aliens. And then actually, Jason Lyle, another astronomer. Uh, a couple of more guys I like that are good. But, uh, yeah, good stuff. Um, Annette clarifying on uh, sleep paralysis. We, we had we had multiple people commenting on sleep paralysis. So Annette said, uh, two weeks after I had a horrible sleep paralysis demon experience, I met my now ex-Muslim -boy, ex boyfriend. But, um, yeah, there's uh, – uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with sleep paralysis, although multiple people in the chat are. But uh, when I was locked up, uh, my bunkmate once – who was a who was a strong dude? Who was a strong dude? Um, it was shortly after he became a Christian. Shortly after he became a Christian, he is uh, he would. I had the bottom bunk. I wasn't there at this time, but he said he was standing on his footlocker. He would stand on his footlocker and then sort of be leaning up against his bed while he's looking at something or, or you know reading a book or something like that. Uh, but he said he felt a hand grab him by the back of the neck, ram his face down onto his bed. And he said he tried pushing as hard as he could to get back up from this hand, holding him down against the bed. And he couldn't move. And finally, he just he just he said, he said, Jesus, I need you to I need you to, to help me here because uh, I don't know what this is. And he said that it then it stopped. So, yep, there is a. There's some creepy stuff going on in this world. All right, everyone. Well, we will see you over on Vocab's channel on Tuesday. Talk to you then. Peace out. Shalom.